if we are to merge with technology, I'm going to merge from a sovereign place, you know? And I, 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 I tell people this, like, I see myself creating my own planet in the metaverse and you coming instead of attending a class or a workshop, you coming to my planet and I'd have these different levels and different environments that you would go through and, and collect these codes and these keys. And it would be a whole thing like that, you know? So I'm, I'm not running away from what's coming. We didn't come here just to escape. We didn't come here to turn away from it all. And, you know, we're already connected. We're already cyborgs to some degree. You know, your phone is a limb. It's an extension of you at this point, you know? So I'm not going to run to go get Neuralink attached into my brain. But I also understand that there may be a point in our time where you would be an outdated model without it. And you would be nothing different than just like a monkey without these advancements, you know? Um, so I think there is a way to merge both technology and nature and not have it to be just one or the other, you know, like where we're headed, you're kind of going to have to play in both worlds. All right. Today's conversation is with Eisen, otherwise known as Eyes In on social media. He's mostly known for talking about the nature of reality in his short form content. And so many people absolutely love it, including me. So one more thing before we get started here, today's sponsor of the podcast, and it's going to be ad free throughout because of it. And it's my book, 10 Secrets of Awakening. If you listen to the whole podcast towards the end, we're going to be talking about feelings, emotions, and the discrepancies and the tricks within that kind of way of thinking and so and way of being really. And I wrote a whole chapter on that in the book. So if that's interesting to you, and a lot of the things we talk about today are also in the book, check that out. Otherwise, let's get into it. I, want, I had an idea of where I wanted to start. Sure. Um, you know, your universe, the game, right? It's the name of your podcast. So I wanted to kind of let people in behind the veil a little bit at how we met and how we came into each other's fields. Yeah. I was... I was in bed one night scrolling through Instagram as every visionary does. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I had come across your profile and I was going through a couple of your videos and I saw the book that you, you just released. And, and then two minutes later, lo and behold, a DM pops up from Nick saying, Hey man, I, I love your work. I appreciate you in the space. And I was like, Oh wow like literally moments after I stopped looking at your stuff, you came through and there was a deep knowing, a felt sense that we were supposed to connect. And, and there is, there is a vibe here. There's a vibe here. So I appreciate you. I'm following through with that signal and making that connection and bringing us to this moment today. Yeah, man. And I was legit. Yeah, I really do like what you're doing. So when you think things like I feel like that happens to people a lot of times, there's these so-called synchronicities or these moments where you think, how can that happen? Is that a coincidence? What do you really think that is? You know, just kind of diving into the concept. Yeah, yeah. You know, I feel like we are connected to all these aspects of self, whether you're talking about probable future selves, aspects of your past self, parallel lives, past lives. Like there, we are the whole and we have like tentacles into all these aspects of self. So I, I, you know, what I feel is that I had connected to a probable future self of us being, um, in conversation, let's say, and that kind of synchronized lined up with the time that you were reaching out. So it was like this felt sense, um, yeah, yeah, just just in terms of being connected to the all. Yeah. Dude, that's a great that's a great place to go because pretty much every podcast we cover that somebody either mentions, you know, God, the creator, consciousness, um, the field. I've had many people call it many different things and mm -hmm. you know, part of this podcast is, you know, it's research. To me, I think the mm -hmm. wisdom really comes from you start to really dive deep and see what living wisdom is and i feel like you have that and so you've done many things you've had your medicine journeys too that i know mm -hmm. which i know about and 
you know, when we think about this concept of the creator, God, consciousness, or the all, the, I think that the first place I heard it called the all was actually the Hermetic Principles um, mm. and the Emerald Tablets. They call it the all as well. I don't know if that you got it from there or if you're just like, that's just what it feels really good to me. So when you think mm-hmm. of the concept of the all, how do you think that that kind of plays out? Well, first, I think part of uh, what we're doing is taking back even the term God, right? That that term has been kind of hijacked in a sense to disconnect you from the all, to separate you from the all and to have people identifying it as like your dad, but in the sky, shaming you and being judgmental and like being upset with everything you desire to do and and... A lot of this in terms of taking our power back is taking these terms back, you know, and there was a time where I hesitated to even like put in my post or say God, say the word God, because it it felt so loaded that a part of me kind of knew that I would lose people just from saying God, I would lose their attention, you know, hundred percent. Yeah. Um, but I've made peace with that and it's time to take, take that term back. So when I say the all in all, I'm speaking of the most high. I'm speaking of just pure consciousness that is working through everything at all times. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So do you think there's a creator to this game? I read a book once. Yeah. I don't remember the title of it, but this gentleman, it was from the 1870s, 18 something. And this gentleman went about trying to prove God's existence. And he gave the example. He said, you're walking in the woods and you come across this like a uh, pocket watch. Okay. You open this pocket watch and you see all the gears moving in such a specific order that it's like keeping time. He went on to say, like, you would see this pocket watch and know that it was created. You wouldn't see this pocket watch and think it was just like a fluke. It just, it just exists in the woods. You would have a feeling that this was created. And similarly, when we, when we really feel into the harmony that is governing everything that we experience, it's kind of like that same pocket watch. The gears are just moving so perfectly that we're able to really live, you know? So is there really a creator? I feel as though I am the creator of my reality. So there must be a creator. Kind of like the as above, so below principle. Yeah, in a way, I would say um, the same force that governs the cosmos is within us, you know? and. I was, I was, I was uh, raised Islamically as a Muslim. And there's a verse in the Quran that says, God is closer to you than your jugular vein. Right? So if we think like the actual translation is God is closer to you than your carotid artery. And for anyone who's done jujitsu or any kind of sport like that, you know that when you're being choked, you're cutting off the circulation for your carotid artery, and that's how you lose consciousness. So it's like God is closer to you than the very pathway to your consciousness. You know, and when we even begin to conceptualize what that means, we fragment because we can't even hold it. You know, and that's, I think, our our incomprehension is our comprehension in a sense. You know, it's almost like there's a knowingness that you can obtain. Uh, there's like a feeling. You know, I think that's what we find a lot of times at the heart of traditions. People will say the presence of God and they can feel the presence of that. And they can feel the, the feeling of it. And to me, that's almost like a unity. You know, they're describing mm-hmm. a unity, but they're using different terms. And I agree with going back to what you said. It's hard to use the word God, you know. I mentioned in the podcast I did with Todd that the Buddha didn't want to say God because Mm. people had too many preconceptions of what God was. And I I get it, man, because there's been the whole Western ideology of that. And then there's other 
uh, ones that I feel like are closer as well. But specifically like Christianity, which is one of the most popular, I think it's the most popular maybe in the world. It's pretty close. Yeah. If it's not, <laughs> I haven't checked the statistics, but I think, you know. I think, I think Islam is the most popular, but is it, is it? I think so. Okay. I think so. Yeah. You know, dude, I kind of want to know. <laughs> I'm gonna look that up. Let's What's pull it the, up. Let's pull it up. What, dude, I wish I had a guy that was like, Hey, look that up. <laughs> What's the most popular religion in the world? I was raised Christian. Catholic. Mm-hmm. My dad was my dad was Catholic. My mom was kind of non-denominational. Okay, let's see what we have here. Most popular. Let's see. Christianity is number one with two point three eight two billion. Wow. Okay. That's what it says on here, and then we've got so Islam like- number two, one point nine. So not uh-huh. not okay. too far behind. Then Hinduism, then Buddhism. Then after Buddhism, it drops off. So, I mean, Islam mm. and Christianity are both at about 2 billion. And then you have Hinduism at about a little over one and then half a million. And then 26 in a Sikhism. And so, Sikhism. Yeah. yeah, Sikh. Yeah. So you've got a really big drop off. Mm-hmm. And so with Islam, how, mm-hmm. what do you think are some people that have, that were, a part of that, like since you've had that journey, I don't think I've ever talked to anyone um, on this podcast yet that has had that background. So, mm-hmm. you know, being where you are now and kind of growing up in that environment, what do you think some differences are from where you're at now to where you were in terms of your perception? And what do you, what do you think that, how does that feel? You know, kind of diving into that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I think the major, let's say evolution has been, transitioning from an old God world narrative of reward and punishment and more so in this where the old God world narrative where God was outside of you, like I said, right? Rewarding you, punishing you. It's evolved over the years to an understanding of cause and effect, less about good and bad, you know, punishing you, giving you a reward, but more so about an understanding of every effect has its cause and knowing the power that you have in in that and also too you know a lot of a lot of the understandings of god through islam is a like an equalizer so there's a lot of terminology about like you know the scales of justice or um like essentially describing karma and energy and how things will naturally balance themselves, you know, and less about somebody orchestrating it and more so about the nature of reality itself as its own equalization kind of process. So, you know, for me, it was leaving the reward and punishment kind of uh, ideology of seeing my life in that way of sinning or doing good, you know, and really carving out my own path and taking that power back and seeing the cause and effect of my life. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I feel like that's a big part of the two biggest religions, right? We've got Christianity is the same way, the judgmental. And I do think, you know, I've studied a lot of works and done a lot of mm-hmm. research on this and just went within really felt that as well which I think that's important, right? To balance those. And to me, when you think about the concept of judgment, it is helpful to somebody who has no morals. So if someone is completely moralist and they just want to you know, harm everyone, for them to have judgment, that is a raise in the level of consciousness from the lowest level of shame, if we're talking about specifically uh, Dr. Hawkins and his work. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's extremely limiting because it's not necessarily close to truth. You know, from my experience, tell me what you think of this. Mm -hmm. I talked about this in my book too. There's a, basically you can imagine that there's force fields and the force fields are different emotions. And then when you're in a, you basically through your actions and through what you, what you perceive, it kind of puts you in a force field. Um, And that that's kind of what people call creating the reality. And so it's kind of like a feedback loop. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. But if you want to, like, let's say you're in a lower force field, maybe you're in fear. If you want to get out of that, then a lot of times it's forgiveness. And mm-hmm. that's the kind of, th- the feeling of compassion and uh, forgiveness is the thing that allows you to kind of get out of that force field and maybe into a different perception. And so that's kind of how I see karma in a modern day sense that there's these different fields and we are kind of like an electromagnetic charge within the greater magnet of the universe. And we're kind of just going from field to field through our perception. You know? mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. You said about the emotions and the feedback loop, because kind of how I teach the understanding of emotions is this character that you're playing as, right? You're playing as Nick and Nick, comes with his own templates, his own create a character attributes, let's say. And these, these emotions that you pass through, it's like this feedback, this reverberation through various events that's giving you the feedback about the character. So you're able to now through your events, the emotions, the energy and motion is the information that is coming to you about yourself. So being able to pass, let's say, with your terminology, being able to pass through to a different field, different to, to access a different state of being, let's say, right? That is now a product of the template of the beliefs that you're currently holding, right? So the, the pathway to that forgiveness, that pathway to self-compassion is really to understand what you're currently believing about yourself, you know? That, that, the, to bridge the gap between where you stand and the self-compassion that you might seek to access is, is your beliefs, you know, and being able to really kind of reconstruct the story that you're attaching to, right? Is that, that pathway to self-compassion. And really when we are embodying compassion, you know, there's no distinction between us and compassion. You become compassion. You are not experiencing compassion. You are actually embodying compassion, you know? So this is what I feel like when we're accessing these states of being, um, you become that, that is you, right? In the same way that when you are in fear, there's no distinction between you and fear. You are fear in that moment. So, yeah. Mm. So what do you think the self is then? When you, when you say you, when that, when that sense of self comes up, what do you think lies at kind of the base of that perception? And is it moldable in that sense? Yeah. So what, say, say your, say your question again for me. So when you say you can become, uh, mm. compassion, what is the you that you're referring to in that moment? The you in that moment is the character that you are playing as in that moment, that identity that is, that is your personality, let's say, right? The byproduct of all your beliefs, your prenatal programming, your conditioning, your experiences, your trauma, and all this stuff becomes this like overlay of your character. So the you in this moment that I'm speaking to is that you that is comprised of all these pieces. Okay. All right. Do you think that there's a you beyond that as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. You are just a fraction of the gestalt, right? The bigger picture. You are some of all those pieces. So right now you are experiencing yourself as that piece, right? And although you are connected to all the other pieces, you know, this form, this, this human experience that we're having is just that, just a piece of that bigger picture. So there is, I believe there is a you, a self that is comprised of all the selves in a sense. Do you think there's only one self or how many selves do you think there are? I think when we try to quantify it, we're getting stuck in like a linear way of thinking, you know, it's almost as though if it it can be captured through the mind, you've already lost it. If you're trying to like reach for it with your mind, your it, it can't it can't exist within the confines of the of the rational mind. So to even quantify and say there are you know X number of selves or this is how many pieces are attached to me, it's I think it uh, we kind of limit ourselves in that process, you know. Hmm. Yeah, I I feel it. It's it's a lot of speculation, right? 
Yeah. It's hard to tell. It really is hard to tell. I'm just curious as to, you yeah. know, your thoughts on that. And, and you know, that's kind of the exploration here is how does this universe work? What's going yeah. on? Uh, and as we explore, a lot of the times we don't know. And I think it's hard to say. Yeah, for me, when I think of how many, like at the basis of that question, it was kind of like, what is, is there one self? Is there one being? Is the universe one being? Is it multiple? You know, and the reason why I say this, because there's actually different, a lot of people in the spiritual community will say there's, there's one, but there's actually different uh, ways to look at it. Like in human design, they talk about how it's a biverse. It's not just a universe. Um, mm-hmm. and there's a universe inside of another one. And uh, that's what he got. Um, that would be the creator of human design, who is, I think his name was Robert Krakauer. If I did that right. Uh, he goes by Ra Uruhu. And mm-hmm. that happened in 1987. And, I'm into that because my girlfriend is is like a human design connoisseur. Mm. And she just is so deep into it. And I love it. I love it. And it seems like for me, I don't know how your journey has been with this online, but I'm just kind of like in the moment, what do I find interesting? And that's mm. kind of what I'm talking about. And mm. I'm not really like, uh, I think there's certain people that are like that. You know, this is my thing. But I've actually kind of had to give myself a permission slip to just talk about how I'm feeling and and what I what I'm perceiving in that day versus like being this is a schedule, this is the topics, and this is this, you know. Right, right. How, how have you found that? Have you been have you found it successful to be able to allow yourself to flow and express in that way, or has it been a challenge for you? Well, it was a challenge at the beginning because a lot of strategic people online will tell thing tell you things like you got to pick a niche right. and you've got to get really dialed in to this specific thing. And I kind of took that to heart too much. So I kind of had to let go and just be like, this is, you know, I'm going to talk about these type of things for the most part. And I think even now I'm expanding more, especially mm-hmm. since I've been really getting into the podcast. I post clips about whatever the heck I want um, because I'm, I think there's different levels. You know, at the beginning, when people start to make content, I think it's like, I'm going to talk about, for me, for a while in my bio, I had science, spirituality, and ancient wisdom, mm-hmm. linking those. And so I kind of stayed within that, but that's pretty broad. So mm-hmm. at first, I, I started to listen too much about what the strategy should be versus just being myself. And I got to give props to you, dude, because really, for sure, it really feels like I'm sitting with you. <laughs> you know, when, I, when, you're, when you're talking, it really feels like I'm right there. In that space. And actually, a question for you, has that been hard for you to to really get to be able to do that in front of camera? Because I know a lot of people have problems with really showing up uh, how they feel and expressing that, you know? Yeah, I think it was it was a skill that was cultivated. I, when I first started coaching, let's say over two and a half years ago, um, which was like answering the signal to step into the space and, and really apply myself in this way, um, there was a lot of limiting beliefs that a lot of layers I had to work through. Um, and even still do to this day, you know, with every kind of new offering, you're, you're feeling your edges every time you expand into that next thing. It's like you're feeling the edges. So I think, you know, um, it was natural for me to experience that at the time. And it was just something that came kind of with practice and finding comfort in that. And, and, um, yeah, you know, at times it's, it's, it's harder to share your own process instead of just like strictly teaching, you know? Um, but I think it's really important to let people in on where you are, what you're experiencing and come through expressing that in, in, in authenticity and really bridge that gap, you know, and allow, cause like through feeling, we're able to connect to each other. So people are able to feel with you, feel the path you've traveled, to feel the, the the frequency that you're anchoring in. And that's in essence what's going to like align and magnetize those people meant to learn from you. So yeah, there's a process for sure. Yeah, you're just really stepping in and just sharing, just being like, this is actually an interesting question because yeah. I hear people say this a lot. Uh, people say, be you. And I'm like... It's a hard one because I feel like most people, not most people, but many people, many less people now because I think we're really starting to get it as a society more so in the last couple of years. 
But when you say be you, a lot of times I feel like people don't even know who they are. They don't even know what they are. They don't even know what they're capable of. So it, it, I think it's kind of hard to tell someone just to be yourself because many people don't even know, you know, have any sort of connection to that because they're kind of stuck in the, the thoughts and the mm-hmm. habits and the patterns of how they've been versus how they could be if they stepped outside of that, you know? Yeah. And that's the whole thing with like, be authentic. It's like, okay, but you've been authentic to who you were at that time throughout your life. So that was authentic to who you were. Now it may have been wearing masks. You may have been performance acting. You may have been, you know, (laughs) a lot um, of people on Instagram doing that. (laughs) Right. Right. But, but, but it's still, it's still authentic to that embodiment. So I think be you, as you're saying, you know, it's so vague that people imprint their own beliefs upon that. And it actually serves, I think now, as I'm just exploring it with you, I think it serves to, to place you in a distant future of endedness where it's like, Oh, well, when I'm me, everything will be good. You know, when I fully express in my authenticity, everything will just kind of be perfect. And it's like creating this you that you are not in this moment and having you, it's like creating this tension between where you stand and where you think you ought to be. Right. And that kind of separation is felt as suffering in that moment of like, I'm not being my authentic self. I'm not being me. I'm not. And it's like, yes, you are. Yeah. Yeah, you, you are, but that's just where you're at. And then it's like, I want to be here. So I'm trying to be something that I'm not in the moment. But then we come to this question of what defines what you are and what you're not. And then you really get into it and you kind of start to see to me at least that Mm. you are what you think you are. (laughs) And that's your perception. And that's the basis of emotions and, and your actions that you take. And that right there is the key. I feel like to facilitating all transformation, it's like you see how fallible your own perception can be. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. for me, it was realizing I'm not always right in the sense that the way that I think about the world is not always accurate to how the world really is. And so you, for me, I had to really understand that the world isn't all negative, even though that's kind of the path that I took. I started to see all the... So the um the distortions in the world. And I started Mm -hmm. to get really salty, really frustrated. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. why is the world this way? But then I realized that it actually isn't that way completely. There's parts of it are, but I actually said, I'm doing my challenge right now. Mm -hmm. And I said today, the negative voices are always the loudest. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of people think the world's in the place, in a bad place. And it's like, that's just the transformation. And I feel like once we go through that journey, the hero's journey, we kind of see that there's times where it looks bleak, you know, it looks Mm -hmm. dark. Mm -hmm. I've had those moments, you know, have you? Yeah, I think we we all have in a sense, you know, and as as you're speaking, what comes to me is the world seems dark, you know, the the seed, and I've spoken about this uh, in, in videos in the past, it's like the seed to the untrained eye is being crushed by all that soil that there'd be no way that that seed could grow in those conditions. It's too dark. There's no light. And, but we know that that is the optimal conditions for growth for that seed. That is the only way it has a chance to grow. And if it's nurtured correctly and it gets adequate light and water, um, it will become what it's meant to be, you know, but initially it may feel like that seed is completely covered in the darkness. You know, and oftentimes what you said too, to, to tie it into about, um, you are who you think you are, you know, that seed must be willing to let go of being a seed in order to become what it's destined to be. And oftentimes I think that's what gets in our way is our identity where we're attached so desperately gripped onto being what we are, believing what we believe. You know, that we, we really struggle to accept that death 
that death of identification to allow the seed to germinate and to blossom. So you are what you believe, you know, and if you believe you're a seed that can only stay a seed, you will stay a seed. Why do you think people struggle so much with the letting go? Fear of death. I think it all boils down to a fear of death, fear of your non-existence. So if I'm not who I think I am, then who am I? You know, and that underlying fear of non-existence, you know, we see that as a mechanism of control today in society. You know, the fear of death is really what predicts people's behaviors, has them in this fight or flight survival mode. And they operate as such. Their behavior is predictable. You know, they're easily herded in one direction or another. So part of claiming that sovereignty back is facing that fear of death and experiencing that through these consistent identifications being dissolved. Everything you think that you thought you knew about yourself goes away. And it's like this constant cycle of death and rebirth, you know? Yeah, for sure. So you've had experiences, you know, doing that through your own practices and I've talked to other people and they've also had experiences with, uh, you know, ayahuasca or psychedelics or these other compounds that will aid in this process. And I know that, uh, that's a big path for some people. And mm. so what are, what do you think the balance is between those two and kind of what's your experience with uh, medicines in that sense? Yeah. So for me, you know, ayahuasca has been a very powerful teacher, ancient technology that has really supported me through the past couple of years of my expansion. And, you know, the work I do moment to moment, let's say, allowed the integration to really take shape through these experiences. Now, what I've come to see is the there's there's kind of so there's two systems there's a finite system which is like looping life preserving you know life sustaining um, system and then there's an infinite system where it's life giving life nourishing life creating so what i've seen through the the use of these plant medicines is both systems in place one where they are less about medicine and they are more about drugs and enabling a person to continue looping and looping and looping. So you'll have people having these massive expansions through plant medicine. They will see beyond the veil. They will meet their dead grandmothers. They will have all these visions and insights and everything. And then they're back into this density. And they were only able to like retrieve a couple souvenirs along the way, you know, and then they go back. They go back to the plant medicine and they continue kind of to loop and, and really nothing tangible is shifting in their lives other than some things, like I said, that they've been able to kind of hold as souvenirs. So plant medicine without integration, plant medicine without tangible shifts in your life, it's nothing short of using drugs to loop. You know, and I've witnessed this firsthand in, in, in ceremonies, one in particular, where I saw the difference really up close between being a medicine man or being a drug dealer. You know, are you helping, are you helping guide people or are you enabling them to continue looping? And yeah. what, I, what I came to understand is that ayahuasca specifically, she doesn't care. The feminine spirit of ayahuasca, she doesn't care. She's experiencing herself through all these different ways. So there is no right way, wrong way. It's like even if somebody's looping and doing ayahuasca 200 times, she's experiencing herself through that way in the same way that she's experiencing herself through a person who does it a handful of times and integrates and moves on kind of thing. So there's that's what I've noticed, the kind of the duality of the medicine, of the plant medicine. And questions of integrity with it being served the way in which it's served is it is it an integrity or is it somebody is attaching to an identity of being a shaman of being a medicine person and that being why they serve 
you know, um, instead of truly stepping into being a guide, and being a keeper of the medicine. Yeah. yeah. So kind of on that note, mm. you're, you're living in Costa Rica most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How do you think that affects, affects the understanding of it being, you know, in that environment and not like coming and going? Do you think that that has, kind of plays into it as well? Because, you know, you're around it more, I would assume. You know, if you came and gone all the time, it would make sense. But, you know, you've been there mm-hmm. and being in, living in Costa Rica, I would just love to hear what that's like, man. You know, I've never been out the country and uh, I just want to know, just really hear, what's it like to be out there and to, to live and, you know... I'm sure you've probably seen your fair share of integrous and non-integrous and yeah. Mm-hmm. Love yeah. Hear. It's a little, it's, it's, it feels layered. The question um, first, I'll start with, yeah, take it wherever you want. Man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, so the majority of the times I've sat with ayahuasca was, was in Canada um, with my shaman in Canada over two years of sitting in circle with him. It wasn't until I went to Costa Rica and sat in a different circle um, that I started to see the different side of things, um, in terms of how oh, the okay. medicine is served, the integrity behind the serving of the medicine. So, um, Costa Rica itself hasn't been the majority of my experience with, with the uh, ayahuasca, but I'll say living in Costa Rica, living in the jungle, it's man, it's something else. Like there is such a very special frequency out in the jungle and we're on the Caribbean side. So you really, the jungle has a way of either spitting you out or kind of reclaiming you into it. And, you know, we, we've seen with, with our own guests and our own visitors, people sometimes really struggle out there, whether through bug bites or things going kind of off course a little bit, but, um, it, it has a very special frequency and, and those who are drawn to it, it's, um, how can I say? I'll give you an example. Like at nighttime, it's never silent. It's always, there's always noise. There's always the vibrations of the bugs just going, going 24 seven, 24 seven, you know, and it, I feel like it does something for ourselves being surrounded by all these vibrations. It like connects us differently to the, to the nature that surrounds us. Um, but the jungle man has a way of teaching you and coding you, um, you know, like you, you'd be surprised. Be careful where you walk. You'll have like, you won't even see it. And you'll have like these spider webs and these massive spiders. And you'll just like, so uh, she's, she's I got bet. a way of teaching you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, spiders, dude. Not my favorite. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not like that guy that's scared of everything. Man, I lived out of a rooftop tent for a year. Uh, I'm just not a mm-hmm. fan of spiders specifically. Um, I've seen a rattlesnake once and it scared the absolute shit out of me. I was in Colorado. Uh, I was walking my dog and this rattlesnake, uh, you know, we were like a, a lot of times in Colorado, there's high, high brush where you're yeah. walking through like this path. And so it's, I can't even see it. I don't know where it is. And my dog's like ahead of me and he's off leash. And I'm like, I hear the noise. I get scared the absolute shit out of me and I'm running. And then he's like, comes back and he goes right where the rattle. I'm like, Oh God. Oh, no. Yeah. So we've had a, a couple animal experiences. Um, a lot of coyotes, uh, out in Arizona, mm. but you know, I haven't seen too many big spiders in my life. Uh, maybe I'm just watching too many animal documentaries and I have when I was younger. Uh, but <laughs> Well, I don't know about that, but you know, it's, it's just part of the culture and it's just part of different areas of the world. You know, you're going to see these, you go to Australia, you're going to see these weird standing things that want to box you that got a pouch right here. You know, and the kangaroos want to kick just the crap jacked, out of you. Just jack right. kangaroos. Just, just, just crap you. steroided up. Just <laughs> up, dude. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what happened with them. Did they like, did, did one kangaroo get steroided up at like the beginning and then it just like never got unsteroided and now they're all just completely jacked? I don't get it. They've been That's training. They've been training for this this whole time. You've just seen it <laughs> now. They're ready. If the apocalypse happens. <laughs> kangaroos, bro. It's, kangaroo. it's kangaroo. 
<laughs> it's kangaroo and Bigfoot. I swear to God. <laughs> I think Bigfoot's a thing, man. In Pacific Northwest, I think it's probably a thing. But they're just so smart that we just kind of get little traces of it. That's just my own speculation. I have no proof of that. Uh, but to bring it back to spiders, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. so it's mostly spiders that scare people out there, or what else is there? Is there you snakes know, and stuff too, or what? There's, is there? there's there's snakes, there's spiders, there's uh, lots of different ants, there's lots of different bugs, you know, stink bugs and this bug and that bug and poisonous frogs and all these things. You know what? I had to really learn in order to uh, coexist in that in that habitat was to interact with these critters without fear. You know, when there's something that's like on your bed or, you know, on the doorknob or something, it's like, how do I now interact with this um, being not from from a place of fear? Because that's what they'll pick up, you know. So, yeah, whether it's whether it's ushering a, a giant beetle out of the room or something like it really took some time for me to now approach it, not from a place of fear, but more so just like a cohesive energy between the two so yeah and i remember watching your stories one time and you were i think you had a bat in there or maybe something hit something big there's something big in there bro and it was like <laughs> <laughs> you were like no man i sound like such a bitch when i say that but i don't care man sometimes i mean it even happens here there's been places we've stayed where there's been like uh <laughs> There's been big spot like and we stayed at Airbnb in Arizona and I did have a spider experience and I did have to take a Ziploc box thing and you know put it on top and then slide the slide the thing underneath and flip it. So I have had it, you know, this is not my favorite, but um but yeah, I'm I mean, it's so funny because our ancestors were just out there. Just that's that's normal life. That's that's normal life, even with many cultures around the world. They live like that. And I think it has a specialness to it because then you're kind of more one within nature. I do think even after I say all that and I'm, people are probably thinking, yeah, he just wants to live in a nice box where nothing happens. That's not <laughs> what I'm saying. I'm saying like, I do think we kind of do live separated in the way that we do, especially I'm in this place in Austin, Texas and you know, you're in your own box and yeah. that, that has its pluses and it also has its minuses. You know, we don't have the community aspect and especially in, um, you know, North America, we are just kind of separated from nature a lot of the times. And I do think that there's keys in that, mm -hmm. you know, connecting back to the origination, because I think people think this is just my thoughts on it. Yeah. love to hear yours. Yeah. People will think that technology, it's either technology or we go back to the stone ages. But I do think yeah. there's an organic technology, whether that's, you know, certain glands and your, in your brain or whether that's uh, abilities we don't have activated right now. I think there's a, there's a way to be in harmony with both without it having to be either. We're all have these things within us and we're connected and we've got all these gadgets in us or on us. And it doesn't have to be, you know, so polarizing, you know? Yeah. And I, and I think our consciousness has explored what it's like to be indigenous, let's say to the lands where we're living off the land, we're farming, we're like, I'm not going back there. You know, I'm also uh, understanding that you are to merge with technology, I'm going to merge from a sovereign place, you know? And I, 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 I tell people this, like, I see myself creating my own planet in the metaverse and you coming, instead of attending a class or a workshop, you coming to my planet and I'd have these different levels and different environments that you would go through and, and collect these codes and these keys. And it would be a whole thing like that, you know? So I'm, I'm not running away from what's coming. We didn't come here just to escape. We didn't come here to turn away from it all. And, you know, we're already connected. We're already cyborgs to some degree. You know, your phone is a limb. It's an extension of you at this point, you know? So I'm not, gonna run to go get Neuralink attached into my brain. But I also understand that there may be a point in our time where you would be an outdated model without it. And you would be nothing different than just like a monkey without these advancements, you know? Um, 
So I think there is a way to merge both technology and nature and not have it to be just one or the other, you know, like where we're headed, you're kind of going to have to play in both worlds. You think so? So yeah. that's interesting. That's a unique one. Uh, usually people are one or the other. Um, so mm. this is new territory for me and I like it. So <laughs> what do we think about this? It's like, so you think we're going down a path where we're going to have to do that stuff then? Like it's inevitable? Was that your thoughts? I think it looks like it's heading in that direction, whether it's augmented reality or full on virtual reality or even just technology that allows you to speak different languages, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think we're closer to that than we think we are based on, you know, you wake up for the most people wake up, you're on a small screen, move to a medium screen, go to the big screen, come back to the small screen, come back to, and it's like from screen to screen to screen to screen. And it's like, we're already kind of been digitalized in a sense. You know, a lot of our experience in the day is through digital mediums. So will it be just a natural extension of that as things progress? Probably, you know, and it's important to, to not, to not approach it with fear. Similarly, like the bugs in the jungle, you know, you, yeah. you don't want to go, you don't want your actions dictated out of fear. So running to the woods to escape and like just needing to grow your own food and, and, and hunt and do all this stuff just to escape what's coming. It's like, okay, that's an option. Another option is to continue cultivating your skills so that you're able to adapt with whatever shifts come. And then if there is a time that comes where you are to merge with technology, you're doing it from a sovereign place, not already plugged into a hive mind, you know, understanding that it's a tool for you. It's serving you. You're not serving it. So there's a way to really still hold on to your power and be able to merge both together within your reality without having to choose one or the other. Hmm. Interesting. For me, it's kind of like, I don't see it happening. And I don't see it happening because it, for many reasons. Number one, I don't think we're going to have, get. I think we're going to try to get to that point, but it's going to go so terribly. Like, for, ex for example, look at the meta, like what Zuck did with the metaverse right now. Yeah. It's like trash. Um, yeah. And people are like completely turned off. But, you know, if they had a better graphics and people would say, oh, you know, if it was like realistic, would we do it? Maybe. Mm -hmm. But I still always think there's going to be a, a large portion of the population that doesn't want to completely do that. I think it's going to be very, very hard to get mm -hmm. everyone to do that or the mass the mass majority of people especially with the clown fiestas people are really starting to realize that you know not every human has your best interest at heart uh to say the least and so when we see that i i think that it's going to be an option and there's mm. going to be a certain amount of people that do it but i don't think it being i don't think it's going to get to the point where we have to or else we're stupid i think there's going to be a, a way for us as i kind of see it like this yeah as technology rises in the digital sense so does human consciousness to me mm. People often say, well, if we're more technological, then we're actually getting dumber. You'll hear that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, there's going to be a certain percentage of the population that is really tapped into the uh, spiritual nature. There's a reason why you look at the spiritual awakening uh, hashtag and it's got billions of views. Mm -hmm. So even though a lot of people don't talk about it, I think that a lot of people understand these concepts of spirituality and they can kind of see... Uh, the mechanisms of, um, you know, you losing your free will to these things. So I do think there yeah. could come a time where there really is some integrous, some integrous um, type people who invent things that benefit humans. And I think that that might be a little far away, uh, but we've really got to understand our power first. Mm -hmm. Like, 
I think we can get to the point where we are advanced, but yet not technologically. Like we don't have, we're not cyber cyborg completely. And I do think a good example of this, even though a lot of people might knock on it, is Star Wars. You know, there's people that are tapped into the Force, and you know they can they have these abilities, and yet there's also people who are they're in contact with like their R2D2s and they have them and they use them, mm-hmm. but they're not integrated so much that they've lost the sense of sovereignty. So yeah. I think actually Star Wars is a good example of where I think our reality could go because there's people that are still have abilities. And I, I, I believe, I don't know about you, that people have these abilities now, but they're, you, we just don't know about them. I think that we have yeah. the ability to tap in. I mean, do you think that there's a force that we can tap into? Because I've been a big proponent of that for many yeah. years, that the force is real, um, and we just call it different things, that we have these abilities, uh, psychokinetic or whatever you want to call them, to tap in. Yeah. What are your thoughts? We're going to get a little, it's going to get a little crazy right now. So I, th- I, I believe that this is not the most advanced we've been. And that there's been kind of uh, an agenda of sorts to, to rewrite our history, to have you believe through the theory of evolution, through made up history, that this is the most advanced that this human form has ever been. And, you know, akin to what you're saying is like certain activations and, and, and certain abilities will continue to come online as consciousness expands as well. So... I don't, yeah, I, I don't think that we will become obsolete. I think that we will have the kind of maybe parallel paths to explore expansion, one through external technology and one through that internal technology, you know, and again, consciousness wants to experience it in both ways. So you'll have those people who are right now learning deep energy mechanics, you know, You've probably heard of people who are levitating or able to like move objects ever so slightly. And, and, you know, I'm sure even you've experienced it with, with, uh, with your partner, you know, the telepathy, like she says something you're just thinking about and, or, you know, you see something and it it shows up again in some different manner. So it's like, you're already feeling this force in different ways in your life, you know, and it's, I think it's a cultivated skill that we have intrinsic to us that has been kind of shut off or deprogrammed or, you know, we've been conditioned to think that this is the extent of your technology that is your avatar. So. Yeah. hundred percent. I think that it's just a matter of time. And I do think that there's also people who can do the things that are like star Wars. I, I think that they actually do exist but that they're few, very few, mm-hmm. and that they would never come online and show anyone. Like, people think that there's only negative people who have, like, powers. It's like, no, there's positive people, too. But they're, you know, they're going to play their games. They're <laughs> just like, uh, you wouldn't want to give away your power to everyone and show everyone. And, you know, maybe if you're Superman and you're impenetrable, <laughs> you would. <laughs> but I don't think that's how it is, you know. So, uh but yeah, the force has just been a fascinating concept. And I think when you think about truth hidden in the plain sight, mm. that's like one of the biggest to me is that there's a force that's not good or bad. It just is. It's mm-hmm. there. It's it's within everything. Mm-hmm. It is everything. And you go back to that force, you leave the body. So through your journeys, whether it's plant medicine or not, what are your thoughts on what happens after this experience? Mm. Yeah, one of those other things that comprehending is uh, trying to comprehend it in, in such a linear way of like, oh, I I will reincarnate or I will ascend to 5D or I will, it's like, okay, we can speculate of what will happen, you know. I think that the the bigger picture that you are that I referred to at the beginning continues to exist after your physical body and after this form no longer exists, the energy that is you carries forward, right? Now, how that carries forward, whether that's continuing through parallel lives of Nick and all these different infinite realities, 
or that is, you know, past lives, which are still simultaneous lives that you are experiencing, that energy is still flowing through them. Um, you know, even, even if, let's say, <clears throat> Mm. I mean, even just as, as I'm now talking to you, it's like, does it matter? You know, cause I get, I get caught up in these things, you know, sometimes it's the stories of past lives and, and what will happen after I die. And, and, and these things that are outside of my current experience that end up not really giving me any tangible things to hold on to now, you know, all I know is that, this physical form is temporary and this specific form I'm in is temporary and that's what gives us life. That's what allows us to really ground into this experience, knowing that it's fleeting, knowing that my interaction with you is fleeting. You know, that temporary nature is what gives us an enriched experience should we choose to see it as such. So I know I didn't really answer your question fully. But what do I think happens after we, after we pass? We continue in a different form. I think I just broke my chair a little bit. Shit. <laughs> I keep leaning back on it, and it's just like a chair that they have as an Airbnb. Okay, I'm, me, I got to sit up. Let me flip it to you. What do you think? Well, here, I wanted to go into it part of, partly, and also okay. I wanted to address what you said. Does it matter? And I think that it does matter in the sense of when you talked about earlier, the, the reason I brought that up was okay. because earlier you said fear of death. Yeah. So if we aren't afraid, if we get past that fear of death, if we have knowledge of what happens, then I would say that it does matter because that in, in itself can be empowering to someone. If you do continue on, like, like you're saying, and whether, you know, the, the, the semantics of what happens after you continue on, Maybe that doesn't matter as much, but I do think that the core thought and um, knowingness even that a lot of people may have that I continue on after this experience, that in itself helps you to really step into this is just temporary and I can really go for it without having to play the safe game because mm -hmm. this is the only time I'm ever going to experience anything. And if I don't do it right, I'm going to burn. Mm -hmm. Versus if I know that I continue on and mm -hmm. I know, let's say that there's not judgment and maybe I keep reincarnating as, you know, all the Hinduism and Buddhism belief, which is, you know, 2.2 to 3, probably, I think it's 2 billion total, probably, that believe that in the world. If you do have that understanding, then you're no longer so attached to this particular experience as a fear sense mm. because you'll see people out there mm. like uh, Jordan Peterson will talk about and I I think Jordan Peterson's great and he helps so many people but he's talking about the fear of hell I'm, I'm more afraid of hell than what was it oh it, it was I can't remember can't remember exactly what it was but when you're so afraid you're going to take actions out of fear rather than empowerment so that's why I think that it can help to at least have an understanding of that you're going to continue on versus not exist anymore ever. Mm -hmm. you know? Let me, so. you know, something came through. I want to ask you, let's explore this together because you're a gamer. I take it from you that you're a gamer. I uh, was a gamer. I don't have much time nowadays and I haven't a, gamed in a while, but yeah, for once, once upon most a time, of my life. once upon yeah. a time we were gamers. How, if you were playing an RPG game, okay. How, so a real, a role-playing game for those who don't know RPG, right? So it's like a first person, you're controlling this character, you're going through levels. If you're playing this game and you only have one life, how different would you be playing than if you had infinite lives? What would your experience of, how would your experience of the game differ? Are we relating it to specifically this game or just in games in general? Like games like, in general, like how are you actually going to be playing the game when you know you have one life compared to when you know you have infinite lives? Well, to me, I, if I only had one life, then I'm going to be real careful that I don't uh, 
I don't risk too much. I, I probably won't go for things as much because I just want to live and I just want to make it versus if I have, if I know that I can respawn, then I'm really going to go as hard as I can because I'm not worried about, mm-hmm. uh, I've only got this one life. Uh, so what I feel like would be truth or the, 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 the ethical or moral thing to do in the sense of what I feel like I, I really want to do. I'm, I might go for that more if I know that I have other times. Like, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to really step into it. And if I don't get it right this time, it's okay. Mm-hmm. Versus saying like, uh, worrying about all the details. If I had one life, I'm worried about all the details. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what it has to be every moment, I'm going to mind it. Versus like, this is what I want to do. I'm just going to send it. That's me. What about you? Yeah, it's interesting how we can see it in different ways. You know, the, the the one life may allow you to take full advantage of that experience because you don't know if you're going to, that there's, or you believe that there's no other opportunity to do so. That this is your one shot to experience all that you can to go through this door, to travel in this place, to collect this, to stop off and to be very present in your experience, knowing that this is the only shot you got. I was reading a book by Osho on... Um, the teachings of Jesus called the mustard seed very early on on my journey. And it really, it spoke to me a lot. Osho was saying, and this is Osho's words. Okay. So please. And if anyone's sat with the teachings of Osho, you'll know that he is brutal at times. And he went on to say, again, this was about the teachings of Jesus. He went on to say that he felt that, those who believed in incarnation, that they would come back again and again and again and again, that they potentially lacked a sense of, I've got to do this now. This is my shot. You know, I've got to clear this karma. I've got to create what wants to be created through me. I've got to love as hard as I can love. You know, I've got to really own this experience that I'm having. Whereas like, He's, his commentary was that Jesus came and was teaching on with a sense of urgency. Like, we've got to do this now. You've got to see what you got, what, what needs to be seen now. Accomplish what you're trying to accomplish now. Explore what you want to explore now. This is the life. This is your chance. And not to think that, oh, it's okay. Ah, I don't need to figure this one out. I'll come, it'll come back around. Or, um, you know, we don't need to learn how to alchemize these different energies and play with these things. Now I can, I can, I can do that in the next life. And it's, it's just with conversing with you, it's interesting to see the contrast, how on one hand, um, feeling as though this is your only chance may actually remove that fear in a sense, you know? Yeah. It's different for different people for sure. Yeah. For me, it's really hard to take, Anything that Osho says, because he's one of the most controversial people that have ever been in the spiritual community, because there's a lot of speculation. He did some really sketchy things and lived a real sketch life. Um, but I I get what he's saying. Mm-hmm. It can take someone away or it can empower you. Mm-hmm. Because if, if you think it's just only once, then you're going to try. You could Essentially, it's the, the try argument. If mm-hmm. I'm going to try harder if I have one life, or am I going to try less if I have one life? Am I going to be more nihilistic because I only have one life? Or if I have many lives, am I going to try harder or am I going to try less? Because I have more tries later to do it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I think they're, I think the most important thing to kind of get out of it is that if you consider this life the most important one and you give it everything you got, I think it helps for me to, in my own sanity to feel like there's a respawn. Um, and it seems like there might be a respawn, uh, but not in the same body because that's another thing too. It's like, mm. even if you can, in a sense, continue playing after this, yeah, then you're not going to have the same experiences. You're not going to have the same chances. It doesn't mean you're going to have the same things. And also from a karmic perspective, if you don't try, if you, you know, <laughs> fuck around and find out, <laughs> just keep it frank, <laughs> then you got, you got some sort of things in your next life that might come up from that. So there's, there's that aspect of it too. It's like uh, what you want to do with this moment. That's really the question. Are you going to be here now? Right. 
And if you're not going to be here now, then past lives can be detrimental to explore because you're not going to be here now. You're just going to think about all the other lives. So I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's, that's you know, you hit, you hit it right. Like, is it, is it helping you create a, a relationship with the present moment or is it taking you outside of the present moment? Are you, are you wrapped up in past lives and what you've brought with you? Are you worried about what you'll take with you to next lives? Are you, it's like, are we still kind of now, you know, our anxieties were of the future and our, and our, and our fears were of the past. And are we simply now just expanding that scope to include past lives and future incarnations? You know, right. So it's like, it's kind of carries with it that same energy. And how do we bring that back into the present moment and what is real and tangible that I can hold on to right now that actually helps me ground into my experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, it's like, can you do things? I think that the real crutch that a lot of people will get stuck on, and I think it's really kind of in this niche of what we're talking about. Yeah. Can we do things to improve the future for ourselves without getting lost in improving the future or fixing um, ourselves? Can we do things from an empowered state that will also keep us here and we enjoy and keep us really present, but that, yeah, might benefit us in the future as well? Because if we're in a shitty situation, a lot of times we're going to want to do things to improve the future. But then I think the question becomes, at least from a mental kind of spiritual, psychological standpoint, Mm -hmm. how can we do those things to improve the future while still understanding that we're whole and complete and we can, in our perception, be free at this moment and we don't have to have things or life doesn't have to be a certain way to be free? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if I, if I, I, I think I got you. So for me, a big thing is just taking the step in front of you. Oftentimes we try to overlay our need for predictability on a probable future self. So like, I will think, okay, how am I going to predict? How am I going to build this sense of safety and security and predict my future? And what can I do now to build that? And in a way of seeking of like this finish line that I will feel "Ah, everything is good in the future, you know? So it's like, what is that next step for you? That's it. What is that next step for you? knowing that your soul's expansion does not reside in the realm of what your mind can predict. And anytime you try to really like blueprint out the future for yourself to take care of that future self, you may just be trying to take care of the current self that needs to feel safe and predictable. Whereas your future self, realistically, you will have all that you need to have at that time to get through whatever you're going through. Right? So, come back what is that next step for you you know yeah i uh early on about a year ago i launched i don't have it up now anymore but Mm -hmm. i launched some merch and one of my favorite shirts that i I just made designs myself and i was like let's just put these out there and see if people like them and people did like them but i kind of did like an offering and then you know went away so one of the shirts i had was one step at a time Uh i still have it it's literally right there i mean i could get up and get it one step at a time and like almost wearing that shirt just helps me to realize you can only take it one step at a time. And if I've learned anything in the past couple of years, it's like I can try and predict how things are going to happen. I can have a goal. And I think having that goal is very helpful. If this is what I want to experience, preferably moving towards that um, while alleviating my suffering in the present and kind of directs your life in a, in a way that's beneficial for you and others. But at the same time, I can't predict how it's going to happen. And every time I try to predict how it happened, it's nothing close. It's not even, I wouldn't have never guessed that if you told me when I was, uh, you know, coming out of college, I went to school for kinesiology, then I dropped out. If you would have told me that six years down the line, you would have just keep it real personal. Your mom was going to get real suicidal uh, you were going to leave uh, abruptly, go live in a rooftop tent for a year, run out of money, go live with your dad, get real humbled in detail cars for a year and give it everything you got online. And eventually it will happen. I'd have been like, you're so full of shit. 
<laughs> there's no way that's what's gonna happen but looking back it's like i wouldn't have imagined that it would happen this way but it is actually incredible mm-hmm. the things that happen and you know writing the book is in there and other things that i'm missing out and you know finding my partner and her being a part of that but I still got to the point where I knew within early on, most people don't know this, even on the podcast, yeah. 2015, your boy was making YouTube workout videos. I've, oh. I've wanted to make content for a long time, man. I've been trying different fields and trying to do this. And so I knew within, I really wanted to share a message that was helpful. And I lost 115 pounds. So, yeah. you know, losing that weight and figuring that part out of my life. I was like, I want to help people this way. Mm. But then I realized that it's not just about like, you can lose all the weight. You can still feel like shit, like actually feel like mentally like depressed. And, and that's kind of how it was for me. I realized it's actually the, you can fix the symptoms and you can fix how it looks, but I think it actually stems from within. And then I kind of like switched, you know, to doing what I'm doing now, eventually, you know? Damn. Yeah. You know, you took the, you took you took us back to after college. I would even invite you to look back a year ago. The things that you were directly aiming at a year ago, were they in an attempt to be where you are standing today? A year ago, directly a year ago, like a that? year ago, I yes, they were uh, because that's when I. I. Uh, we ran out of money in the rooftop tent and I'm like, I need to get a job. And I was, you know, I was grounded about it. I'm like, Mm -hmm. let's just get something and do something that I can continue to study Mm -hmm. and work my way up to doing what I love for a living. And when doing what I love is making videos and helping people in in this sense. So about a year ago, that's what I was doing, except I didn't know that I was going to write a book at that point at that time. And I didn't know that I was going to love podcasting so much. Uh, I mean, I kind of knew I had a first podcast named Dispel Illusions. So I have been podcasting for like three years, but mm-hmm. I really started to dive deep into it about six months ago. And I realized the benefit of having a conversation versus just teaching because yeah. there's so much wisdom in one person. You know, there's so much yeah. wisdom within you that I would never get from a book, from a teaching that mm-hmm. even if you, even if I just watch your videos, mm-hmm. there's so much wisdom that I'm not going to get in the way that. There's something about doing these conversations that yeah. it brings out a different side of people. And um, so, yeah, they, they, they were in an attempt to get to the place where I could travel and, um, and have my needs taken care of to really make as much content as possible. You know, I'm making a video every day and making a podcast every week. So, yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 for me, you know, I had this moment where... I had this flash and I was shown all these events re and rewind. And I was shown how in a way, nothing that I was directly aiming at, let's say a year and a half ago, two years ago, max two years ago, nothing I was directly aiming at. We're talking about that. Take that next step. Nothing about that next step indicated where I was going to be standing right now. That next step itself was just, the next step. It wasn't actually showing me where I would end up. And I think to your point in terms of like, every time you've tried to predict, right, you've tried to like send yourself off into the future and predict and and, and create this image of how it'll be for you. It never ends up that way, you know? And it's almost as though like, if we can, if we can conceptualize the path, what would be the point of playing this game? If you already knew how to get to where you were going, what would be the point? That's the important part is if we knew how we were going to get there. Yeah. I think for me, that's the big distinction. Yeah. It's like I I did do a lot of the things. I took all of my senses into the future and I did the meditations. And, yeah. and the meditations were me in the future where I was so happy making videos and, and um, living the life that I wanted to live, traveling. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm doing now. So in a sense, me taking all of my senses into that future timeline, it did end up with this. Like it was a direct correlation, but the how it happened was nothing, but I didn't even worry about the how. And I think that's important is like, I am taking one step at a time with knowing that it's inevitable that this is where I get. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that's the joy of figuring out how am I going to get there? Mm-hmm. And the part of the game is also not knowing where the hell you want to go because there's different paths, right. right? I feel like for you, it's more, I know that I'm guided and I'm just going to take the next step. Mm-hmm. Whatever happens in my life, it's beautiful and I'm here for it. And it's that's exactly how it's meant to be. And I think that lifestyle is one where it is also can be equally successful. And it's just, I think there's different people who are, are um, there's maybe different emotions and there's different ways that you enjoy living. You know, you probably just enjoy living that way and the shit works. And it's like, then, do, then continue, you know, because that's what I think we're all kind of aiming at. So how can I surrender to being here in this moment and enjoy life mm-hmm. um, and, and do things that I like to do and feel how I would like to feel? If we can pinpoint that, what do I want to do and how do I want to feel? Mm-hmm. And sometimes, like for you, it might be just I want to. I'm going to feel this certain way, and you're. And actually, that's another question I'm interested for you. Yeah. What's your thought on emotions and feeling emotions for versus deciding to feel a certain way no matter what? Because that's actually a big debate uh, on how people see that. You know, are you going to yeah. allow feelings to be versus I'm going to choose to feel a certain way? You know. Interesting. Interesting. So as I was saying before, like, I, I, I feel that though the, your emotions are the feedback that you're receiving about yourself, about your character. And it's the emotion is just the information about your state of being, about the current beliefs that you hold. Where we end up maybe getting lost is in the notion of feel it to heal it. So that I must now marinate in my grief let's say, and really feel the depths of my grief in order to heal it. And it has potentially the the avenue of like being lost in emotional turmoil because I'm supposed to really feel the, the full extent of my emotions when like your emotion is there to, to provide you with the information. So what, I, what I've been teaching as well is, you know, can you experience that emotion without needing to shift it right away? Can you actually accept and embrace the emotion that you're having in order to stay open and receive what is is being received, the information that is coming through? But if we instantly experience, whether it's, let's say, anxiety, and I've identified anxiety as undesirable. So when I start to experience the anxiety, I quickly seek to shift my state of being right away. I got to fix this. I got to get out of this anxiety. Whereas... What, what we try to cultivate in, in my containers is, can you be with that anxiety? Can you observe and experience the anxiety as a sensation and then understand the narrative and the, the thought patterns that are, that are associated with that sensation? So now I'm not looking to escape what I'm feeling. I'm looking to learn from what I'm feeling. And I'm also not looking to remain feeling this anxiety as well. So how can I be a student of my experience without falling prey to this notion of feel it to heal it, you know, and also know that my feelings and my emotions are not truth per se. They're truth about me. They're not truth about my external world. So the more I am provided to myself, this chance to learn about myself through these feelings and emotions, now we remain as these humble students, you know, and not trying to fix and change and through non-acceptance and resistance. And now I'm like fighting my own emotions because I have the tools and I know that this isn't desirable. So let me shift it right away. It's like, okay, okay, maybe not, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So you're, you're kind of, allowing it to be when you say like you're accepting that it's there do you feel like you're feeling it or you're just accepting its presence i feel like or i i almost feel as though they are the same i'm feeling its presence and then the acceptance of my state of being follows okay yeah yeah so you're saying that basically we don't have to continually go in there and and feel it you just accept that it's there so then are you choosing differently once you're like, okay, I'm feeling this. So then are you yeah. making a conscious decision to like, this is how I want to feel. I'm going to feel that. And you bring that feeling through. No, 
It's uh, it's okay. not actually a conscious decision of like, I feel anxious. I want to not feel anxious. That in and of itself is creating a gap between where I am and where I my mind desires to be in that moment. So can I just feel the anxiety, learn from it, receive what it is about my current set of beliefs about myself or the event I'm experiencing or the fears I might be having that are leading to the anxiety? Can I just learn from this emotion? And then this naturally, you know, you've, we've learned this through meditation, this like stepping back into the observer almost in and of itself shifts things for you. The desire to shift out of that feeling, I want to feel differently. It's like, okay, that is creating suffering within you. That is creating friction now within you saying that I'm feeling like this and I, I but I want to feel different. It's like, that's where the acceptance comes in. Okay. So what do you think the difference is between that and feeling it to heal it? I just want to understand the distinction. Okay. So there's a distinction between feeling the emotion and then being lost in the, the thought process that is creating this emotion, so to speak. Right. So feel it to heal it. How are you, are you allowing yourself to really get lost in this emotional turmoil? Because you think that you need to like prolong your sadness. You need to prolong this grief in order to actually heal it. If I don't feel it enough, this abstract point of endedness, if I don't feel it enough, that means it won't heal. So I must now feel whatever I've overlaid as enough, as opposed to now like just being a student of that feeling, not needing to fix it, but needing to learn from it. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're not minding like minding as in mind, mm -hmm. mind slash ing the feeling or hyphen ing the feeling by saying, I felt it enough yet or yes or no. It's not like a mind. So you're essentially just making the distinction that it's going to be there as long as it needs to be there, but I don't need to choose for it to be there or not. Am I correct? Because you're accepting what's in your yes. experience. Yes. Yes. You don't need to choose to escape your current state of being. Okay. Right. You're here. We're here to learn. We're here to be students. We're here to receive more information. We're here to see ourselves in different reflections and yeah, at times, you know, I, I used to, I used to do this for myself, man. I'll, here, you can share in personal stuff. I'll share some personal stuff. So like this feel it, the heal it notion once upon a time, I, I think, uh, let's say six years ago now, five and a half years ago now, after I got divorced, you know, I really wanted to feel my feelings. So I would find myself just like, playing sad music and looking through pictures and like, keep like, keep like really feeling the grief of it all. And like kind of perpetuating this, this grief. And, you know, it felt good. That was the thing. That's why, that's why we, we go towards it because it feels good in a sense to be in that, in that, that grief, that sadness, that, that feeling that is, um, we're being told that this is how we're healing, you know? So the way in which we've identified with our feelings and our experience of them and how we interact with them, it's, it's easy to see how, you know, if, especially for men, you have been shut off from your feelings. This is what we're told, you know, society has programmed you, you're shut off from your feelings. So what happens is we've seen now men swing to the other side which means that I need to feel everything and, and I, I need to like really feel it to heal it. You know, this, this getting lost in the emotional turmoil is I think taking us away from grounding into our experience really. So I know that was a long roundabout way, but feel it to heal. It might just be keeping you in this emotional turmoil, you know? Yeah. I, I agree, man. I wrote in my book that there's a healing treadmill 
And that's how I described it. That basically, if you think that you still need to heal in order to be whole and complete, mm -hmm. that's never going to end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a treadmill. Yeah. And it just keeps going. Yeah. And so it's like, how can I realize that I'm whole and complete no matter what I'm feeling? But this moment is what it is. And if there's, um, this, if there, if I'm experiencing anger, all right, it's here. It's not always going to be here, but it's here right now. Yeah. And I almost feel like the unacceptance, that ang the feeling, like the actual sensation of anger is here, is yeah. the thing that causes us to be angry. It's not that the anger it causes the anger by itself. It's that we are not out far enough. Um, observing uh -huh. that anger because anger can be present and I can still be chill. I can still be relaxed. Right, right. It's like when I identify myself as that anger, uh -huh. that's when the problem arises. So if we don't want to be stuck on the treadmill, then we've just got to be able to, I'm looking at this anger and I'm allowing it to be here, but I'm not in it so much that I need to perpetuate feeling it because I'm not enough because everybody says I got to feel it to heal it. Right. right. You know? And man, you like, you know, you said it perfectly, the, the healing treadmill. And that's part of what I, what I would like to do is introduce new vocabulary, because even this idea of like healing our wounds and our trauma, and it, it, it really perpetuates this like victim narrative. And, and to say, you know, I'm on a healing journey in and of itself would infer that you are sick, you are ill, you are scarred, like. And we know, as you said, it's never ending. So you will see that like you, you, it's easy to get stuck in this loop of like the next healing modality, the next thing to heal me. I need to continue healing my wounds. And I'm, it's like, it really serves to disempower, I think, and like leak a lot of energy into this notion that like, I am, I am forever wounded and will always require healing. Whereas I think you and I are seeing our reality through the eyes of exploration and curiosity and less about like, I need to heal this and more about like, let me understand this. Let me reclaim this aspect of myself and integrate it through this event that has played out that is showing me this aspect of myself that may have fragmented off once upon a time. Let me recall this, reclaim this back to me and integrate it into my being that is already whole, you know? So it carries with it a vastly different energy than like I'm healing. I'm constantly seeking healing and like, I'm just exploring and traversing the depths of my soul through this human experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, there's, I think that that stems from how we see, how we see the body a lot of times <clears throat> physically is how we're seeing mental and psychological wounding. Um, and even you could call that spiritual wounding or energy wounding. Mm -hmm. And we a lot of times see these as the same thing when I think what we're getting at is that you you aren't healing in the sense of you now have this scar, you now are like you need to feel it. And, and that is the thing that causes like the physical like that's that's where I think it stems from. It's like mm -hmm. that we're seeing these as the same things right. when to me, I would word it as like we're exposing the reasons why we believe we're not whole or why we believe we're not enough. And mm. it's like exposing is kind of the way that, I, I mean, it might be like an extreme kind of word uh, for the process, but I think it helps to really solidify that. Yeah. I'm just exposing that I'm shining the light. That's how we can see exposure, like the original word. Right. We can expose the the light onto this and we can see, Oh, that's not actually true. And that itself in itself can be the healing. The healing doesn't have to come from the feeling. It, to me, healing happens as a byproduct in the way that most people see it yeah. of us exposing the reasons why we don't believe that we're good enough. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, you could say from a sense that's mentally healing. But again, I think the word is tough. Yeah. The word is tough. I, I feel like there's better, there, there's words, not better, but more accurate words for kind of how that works you know yeah and i think that's what we're we're bringing to the forefront you know new vocabulary and you do a great job of that too like what i admire about you is your ability to really absorb a lot of data a lot of information and yeah. and then integrate it and be able to digestively share it in a format that the masses can really understand and part of that is like even just now using exposed exposure 
you know, which really, if you think of it, the light is shining upon this aspect of yourself. Like when it plays out through an event in your life, through relational dynamics, through whatever, it's something, an aspect of you appears through this external event. Like you said, it's being exposed to the light in order for you to see it, you know, and, and parting ways I'm really been trying to part ways with these words of like healing and wounded and trauma and, and these things that just really kind of paint a picture that it's possible that there are things that are not for us. Right. When we talk about like my wounds, it's like, I like to look at them as ingredients to my awakening, as opposed to things that happen to me. They happen for me that have me where I'm standing today. Right? And this paradigm shift really helps to take that power back. Like, come on, everything is for us. Everything is here for your expansion. Everything is here for you to expose the light of your soul to. And making those shifts, man. Making those shifts. Yeah. I feel like the word that's really sticking with me and another word that I like to use, like if, if, if someone were to say wounded like that, I think the word that I would use is catalyst. Mm-hmm. Just kind of switch that. It's yeah. Like, it's not a wound. It's a catalyst. It's a catalyst. The catalyst that I'm experiencing is I feel like I'm ugly. I feel like I'm fat. I feel like I'm not enough. I feel like I, I'm weak. I feel like I'm mentally not integrous. I don't stick to my word, even to myself. These things can be catalysts. They're not wounds that you need to heal. They're just, it comes with consistency. Like if you don't follow through with your own word, let's say, then what's going to happen is when you just start following through your with your word, that's going to be so-called healing. But what it is, is just consistency. Mm-hmm. You know, if you consistently, I think that's one of the most important things, especially as men, you know, being consistent and for everyone, but I think I can only speak from that perspective because, you know, that's what I'm experiencing right now. So I've seen that in one-on-one containers. I've seen that in the challenges I hold and the courses. A lot of times men will, when they don't, have the ability to follow through with, I'm going to get up and do this. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go for a walk in nature at seven o'clock Mm -hmm. a.m. I've been waking up at 11, but I'm going to do it tomorrow. And if the, the man doesn't have enough, um, it doesn't happen, right? It doesn't have that consistency. That right there, a lot of the times will be the root cause of why people don't think that they're enough it's because they don't even believe what they say about what mm-hmm. they're going to do. Mm-hmm. So how they, how can anyone believe in them if they don't even believe in themselves? So it's like that belief doesn't just come naturally to everyone. A lot of times it might take you just being consistent. And it can be so simple as to, I'm going to get up and meditate at 5 a.m. for 10 minutes and then go back to bed. You know, and once we have that consistency within our own state of being, then we can feel like, oh, other people can rely on me. Because I can rely on myself, you know? Yeah, yeah. And building trust with yourself is a superpower in playing this game. Like truly being able to navigate this this reality with trust within yourself. Knowing that you you have this level of devotion to yourself to show up consistently, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter how difficult it may feel, that you have this level of willingness to be there for yourself, you know? And that, you know, when you build that trust within yourself, man, now when you're getting the signals to, hey, I got to move cities or, hey, I got to leave my job or, hey, I, I need to leave this relationship or, hey, this shift needs to happen. Now you've built this trust within yourself that, you know, you receive the signal, you're able to support it. There's this devotion to self that will have you showing up consistently, no matter what direction you choose to travel, you know, so yeah, building that within yourself, man. It's a superpower, absolutely. Yes, dude. Yes. And then the question becomes, here's a good example. Yeah. Let's say that you get the call to that you need to move to another city. Yeah. Like you you have that, you have that. And we're talking about trusting that. How do how does one determine if they're kind of starting out with that? How do I know that that's not uh, the mind or the ego and that's really what's meant for me and what is that distinction that you've kind of made in your life to be able to develop that trust of like oh this is a feeling like is it a certain type of feeling that comes to you can you recognize it in your body or what's that process 
Yeah, it's man, it's a skill to cultivate. You know, it's not a thing that you just flip yeah. a switch on and now it's like, okay, now I trust the the signal sure. that I'm receiving and perfect. It's like it's like yeah. discernment. You know, when we say use discernment, well, if I had it, I would have been using it. What are you telling me to use discernment? It's like it's something you're building, it's something you're crafting within your experience, you know? And a lot of it I think comes down to just moment to moment listening to ourselves, um, listening to your body. Like you've maybe received the signal that you need to go drink some water and you've muted that signal and just continued working and sitting there. It's like these small game moment to moment, you're, you're building that, that trust. Now for me, you know, these signals I receive as a felt sense. So it's like in that moment of feeling that it's like a knowing of this is the direction. Now what happens is we get that felt sense, right? The universe communicating to us through sensation, through feeling, we get that felt sense. We give that signal to the mind. And now the mind either tries to craft a predictable path, convince you otherwise, um, and do what it does, you know? So to, to kind of elaborate on answering your question, like it's been built over the years, man, that signal that I've received has seen me move out to the woods by myself. It has seen me give my dog back to my ex-girlfriend. I've, I've left, you know, I left Toronto, the city I lived in for 30 years. It was like slowly building that trust through listening to those signals that ultimately, you know, led me to moving to Costa Rica, meeting my divine union, getting married. And like the next steps, it's just like the next step, that signal it's like, this is the next step. Okay. And now the thing is too, about building that trust with yourself is it requires bravery because those signals are typically not going to imply to move in a direction that's like the safest for you or the most predictable for you. It's going to be where your expansion resides. So now can you support that with the courage to go in that direction? You know, like you said, consistency is one thing. The courage to show up and support that signal is, is that follow through. Yeah, even when you think that you have no, or you have no idea where it's going to lead to. Yeah. I think maybe that, that was a theme for you maybe is, and for me too, of course, like where's this going to lead me? I don't know, but I'm just got to trust that. Yeah. How's it been for you receiving the signals? What's your experience with it? It's like a, it's like there's a play just, this is, might sound weird, but this yeah. is, there's a place in my body where it comes from mm. and I, I can't describe where it is. It doesn't feel like it's a, it's a place that I can actually pinpoint, mm. but it's just somewhere. It's somewhere. I don't even know if it's in here. I can even prove that I'm in here. Like what's in here. <laughs> That's another conversation. right? So there's just something that comes and it's a specific pattern. Maybe it's not in the body. It's, it's something I haven't thought about how, that. So that's a good question, Yeah. but it's some feeling that comes to me that's different. And it's been removing the layers of all the other feelings that kind of mute that mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. really, to really kind of discern, Oh, this is really, this is really here for me. Like I can trust that. Mm -hmm. But like you're saying, it's something you develop over the years. And I think it's just a natural byproduct of committing. Like I, I'm going to, I'm going to really commit to not healing. That's for sure. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commit to just this path of what I feel like is going to benefit me maybe, or maybe others um, in the sense of harmony, peace, mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's love, uh, wholeness, many different words. But the more that I commit to that path of like, I just want to feel good. Maybe even it can be that simple you realize the things that how, why and how you're not feeling good. What are the causes? Maybe you're too much in the past, in the future, and you come back here. I think it's presence too, man. The more that mm -hmm. I'm right here in this moment, the more I'm not thinking about the past or the future, the more I'm like actually present with this moment. There's like a, you gain that energy back and that allows you to kind of tap in more, maybe mm -hmm. you could say mm -hmm. to the field. So yeah, yeah. that's been, um, yeah. it's been how that worked for me amazing beautiful yeah, yeah and, and really like learning how to listen you know learning how to listen and i think like you said coming back to that present moment coming back to that stillness and really you know canceling out that noise in the mind to be able to to listen to that signal to feel that reverberation and to to have that felt sense of what that implies what that feeling actually implies you know and and listening to yourself 
you know, listening to these, to these signals really has become a skill in and of itself, you know? hundred percent, man. Beautiful. We got one more question for you. Let's do it. Let's say that, mm. um, you said you went out into the woods at one point in your life, right? Yeah. Let's say that you got the call. Ah, okay. Well, you know, I feel like this signal within, <laughs> you know, I'm just going to go out into the woods and I'm going to take everyone that I want that wants to come with me. You know, maybe it's my partner and, you know, we just go out. Maybe it's just, maybe it's Costa Rica. You're just like, I need to shut off the world. And I feel like that, that part of my life is done. That phase of my life is done for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. It's like, I just want to be completely present in my life. I'm never going to talk to any humans again. You just made, you know, maybe it's not like you, but okay, okay. You, know, you just felt like it was you. If that moment were to come and you realized, oh shit, this is the last time I'm ever going to talk to any humans with Nick's eye. What an honor. Uh, what would you really tell the world about anything? You know, whether it's uh, a message about life, whether it's a message about, uh, you know, a quote, maybe it's a, a feeling that you have or what are some words that if you thought, oh, this is the last time I'm going to talk to or be able to speak to the world, what are some um, contemplations that come to you to mm. share? First thing that came to me was carve your own path. Carve your own path. The expansion of your soul will not occur walking in somebody's footsteps. You know, solidifying when we're talking about these signals, really clearing all the energetic debris to tune into that signal to your soul and, and, and being able to anchor in that frequency right now at this time specifically. So by carving your own path, by having this, the feedback from your experiences that in and of itself clarifies that signal and you are more powerful than you can even imagine. You will never be given anything that you can't handle. Everything that plays out in your life is for you and for your expansion. This entire game, this entire existence is for you. Everything revolves around you. So take care of yourself. You know, be gentle with yourself as you go through this human experience and and don't forget to smile through it all. Don't forget to smile through it all. My shaman, during one of the ceremonies in ayahuasca, he was, he was, uh, sharing one of his stories in the jungle when he was, um, an apprentice. And his teacher at the time told him while he was puking in a bucket, he said, Hey, Sean, don't forget to smile. So I'll leave that with you guys, you know, through it all, through the cleansing, through the clearing, through the letting go, through the surrendering through the acceptance. Don't forget to smile through it all. You know? Very good. Thank you, man. Thank you, <laughs> Thanks brother. for coming on Universe the Game. What a great podcast. Uh, where can people find you and what do you got going on uh, so people can kind of tune into what you're doing? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram at eyes underscore underscore in underscore underscore. So that's at eyes double underscore in double underscore and i'll probably i'll announce it here so people hear it first we have started the great mystery school it's coming soon so if you want to connect with us and be part of that early mailing list the great mystery school.com boom all right great i'll put that in the description all the stuff and when this comes out I'll make sure that we have everything that you have live will be there all your links uh, so if you want to find that check that out in the show notes description if you're on Spotify Apple Podcasts, it's going to be just in the description if you're on YouTube thanks for listening today and thanks for coming on man thank you brother thank you for having me and thank you to everybody listening much love to you all <laughs> wow, what an epic conversation. If you enjoyed it, hit subscribe. If you consider hitting subscribe, if you, I think you might really enjoy sticking around for many of the podcasts we have to come and many podcasts we already have. And that way you get notifications as well when we have another podcast come out. Otherwise, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, check out the ratings and leave a nice five-star rating for your boy here it helps support the podcast so much and i really really appreciate it and lastly 
If you got a lot from this conversation, I think a, a nice supplemental material would be my book, 10 Secrets of Awakening. A lot of the topics we discussed today are in this book. Otherwise, we've got plenty of other podcasts right here on Universe the Game. Check them out. And I will see you in the next podcast. And until then, peace.